Chapter 21 Thursday morning, even though she was an hour late, Reva rode up to the sixth floor, hung her coat in her father's closet, then strode quickly to the bank of security monitors to talk to Hank. She tapped him on the shoulder hard, and he whirled away from the screens. Reva, hi, he looked at her suspiciously. The last time she had passed, she had caught him dead. Hank, it's time to stop the stupid games, she said, her voice low and hard. She had practiced her speech all the way to the store. She knew exactly what she wanted to say. Reva, I can't talk right now, he told her, glancing back at the screens. The store is open. I'm supposed to monitor these screens. She grabbed his arm and tugged, pulling him off the high stool. Hey, let go, he protested unconvincingly. What's your problem anyway, Reva? This will only take a few seconds, she said, but my job. You won't lose your job, I promise, she said, her face still cold and expressionless. She pulled him into her father's office, which was empty, and closed the door. Reva, listen. He stared into her eyes, trying to figure out what she wanted. No more games, Reva repeated, brushing back her hair. Stop playing innocent, Hank. I'm not buying it. Innocent. He shifted his weight uncomfortably, shoving his hands into the pockets of his blue uniform trousers. Look, I guess I was pretty cruel to you, she continued with her speech. I mean... I said some things I shouldn't have. And that night with the guard dog? Well, I apologize. He continued to study her face, his expression unchanging. I hope you'll accept my apology, Riva went on, returning his stare, because I'm asking you for a truce now. I want you to stop trying to frighten me. Huh? His mouth dropped open in exaggerated surprise. You heard me, she said sharply. I want you to stop all the stupid jokes. They're not funny and they're getting out of control. Hank shook his head. He removed his hands from his pockets and raked one back through his spiky blonde hair. Have you totally lost it, or what? Hank! She didn't want to lose her temper, but she couldn't help it. I know you're the one who sent me the dummy in the box and the bottle of blood. Huh? You're not a good liar, Hank, Revis said, glaring angrily at him. You put a needle in my lipstick? You've been trying to frighten me, trying to terrorize me to pay me back for the way I broke up with you, but... No way, he said softly. He took a step toward the closed office door. No way. You're denying it? Her eyes burned into his. No way, he repeated. Hank, I know you hate me, Reva blurted out. She surprised herself. That wasn't in her prepared speech. It appeared to surprise Hank, too. His expression changed, softened. His dark eyes narrowed. Hey, I don't hate you, he said. I feel sorry for you. His words stung like a slap in the face. She uttered a low cry. You feel sorry for me? She felt like laughing and crying at the same time. I don't understand, she managed to say, confused by her strong feelings. Anyone could have sent you those things, Hank explained. You don't have a friend in the world, Reva. Everyone hates you. Everyone. I can think of ten people who hate you enough to put a needle in your lipstick. You're crazy, she screamed. You're really sick. I'm not saying it to be cruel, he replied heatedly. His normally pale face flushed, his dark eyes excited. I'm explaining why I feel sorry for you. But it's not true, Reva started. Tell me one good friend you've got, Hank demanded, moving toward her, looming over her, powerful in his blue uniform. Come on, name one. Well, why couldn't she think of anyone? How stupid, she thought. Of course I have friends. I have lots of friends. Name one, Reva, she challenged herself. Name one. I feel sorry for you, Hank repeated, not backing off, not letting her off the hook. You don't have a friend in the world. Reva let her head drop. She raised it and stared at Hank. He was right. She felt deflated, as if someone had popped her with a pin and everything holding her together had been blown apart. You're right, Hank, she said, her voice a whisper. He stared back at her expectantly, waiting for her to continue. Ever since Mom died, I... I haven't had time for friends. I had to be hard, she said, talking more to herself than to Hank. I had to keep to myself, keep my feelings to myself. I knew if I let my feelings go for one second, I'd lose control and... and... Her voice caught in her throat. They stared at each other, standing close together now. Hank's expression softened, his dark eyes searching her face. I I didn't even cry at Mom's funeral, Reva said. Even then, I knew I had to hold myself in, had to harden myself. Otherwise, before Reva even knew it, she was in Hank's arms. He felt so warm, so strong, so protective. But even now, pressing her face against his, feeling his arms wrap tighter around her, she couldn't cry, didn't want to cry. And even now, allowing herself to be comforted, allowing Hank to hold her, allowing herself to let go just a bit, to loosen the reins that had held her in so tightly, even now Reva felt the fear. Even now she wondered if Hank wasn't the one trying to frighten her. 
Even now, she wondered, what's next? Pam slammed down the phone. No answer at Reva's house, and the line was still busy at Foxy's. Who could he be talking to all this time? She glanced at her watch. It was 8.35, Thursday night. She still wanted to talk to Reva, to find out what was being said in the store, if there were any theories as to who the culprits were who robbed the store and killed the guard. But Reva obviously wasn't home. And Foxy, what was Foxy doing on the phone all this time? Talking to some secret girlfriend? The thought tickled her. She couldn't imagine Foxy sneaking around with another girl. But, she realized, anything was possible. She couldn't imagine herself burglarizing a department store, and yet she had. I'm going to see what Foxy is doing, she decided. She pushed open the storm door and peered out across her small square of a front yard. It was warm out, almost spring-like. The ice and snow had all melted. The air smelled fresh and piney. Pan decided to walk to Foxy's. It was only five blocks. She hadn't had any exercise all day. Having hung around the house, unable to do anything or concentrate on anything, but how sorry she felt for herself. Foxy's being so understanding about this, she thought, crossing the street and walking with quick strides along the sidewalk, past familiar silent houses. He seemed to realize right away that I didn't need him to scold me, or disapprove of me, or tell me what an idiot I was. He's been so supportive, like a real friend, and he's so cuddly and cute. A lot of girls wouldn't appreciate Foxy, she thought, but I knew right away that he was special. Two blocks later, she was smiling to herself, thinking about Foxy, when a hand grabbed her from behind. Before she could scream, the gloved hand slid down over her mouth, holding her too tight to scream. She tried to pull away, but, overwhelmed by panic, her muscles locked. All of her strength seemed to die. She felt hot breath against her cheek. Another arm was now locked tightly around her waist. She was being dragged, dragged off the sidewalk into a dark yard, behind a tall hedge where no one could see her. No one could help. Chapter 22 I can't breathe, Pam thought. I'm too terrified to breathe. Who is it? What is he going to do? The tall hedge seemed to surround her, bend in on her, suffocate her. Don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. Got to think. Got to find a way to get free. Her eyes darted to the house above the sloping lawn. Please, somebody be there. Somebody help me. But the house was dark. The curtains were pulled. The gloved hand loosened a little over her mouth. Don't scream. Don't try to turn around. The raspy voice was right in her ear. Again she felt his breath, hot and wet against her cheek. He shoved her then into the prickly hemlock hedge, still holding onto her. I'm warning you. Don't turn around. Don't yell for help. I'm too scared to yell, Pam thought. I'm too scared to make a sound. She was breathing hard now, breathing noisily through her nose. The gloved hand slipped away from her mouth, and she gasped, sucking in big mouthfuls of air. Don't turn around, and you won't get hurt, the voice whispered just behind her. What are you going to do to me? Pam managed to cry. There was a long silence. Somewhere down the block, a car door slammed. A dog barked. What are you going to do to me? Pam repeated, her voice so filled with terror she didn't recognize it. On the other side of the thick hedge, a car rolled slowly past. Can't you see me? Pam thought, watching the headlights through the shrub. Please, driver, please see me. But the car moved silently by. The lights disappeared. The grip tightened around her waist. I saw what you did, the voice whispered. I was there Friday night. But I don't have any money, Pam whispered back. We don't turn around, he rasped. I'm warning you. They're both breathing hard now. Pam became cold all over, numb, frozen with terror. Please, she said. This is just a warning, he said, not loosening his grip. I can get to you. Easy. I can hurt you. I can hurt you right now. What do you want me to do? Pam whispered, staring at the dark ground. I want ten thousand dollars. That's all. And I want it tomorrow night. But I'm trying to tell you, Pam whispered, choking out the words. We don't have the money. We didn't take any money. Ow! She screamed as both of his hands dug into her waist and he pushed her face into the hedge. Don't lie to me. I was there. I saw you. I'm not lying, Pam insisted. I want ten thousand dollars tomorrow night or I'm going to the police. Do you hear me? Instead of replying, Pam took a deep breath. Then, with a burst of strength, she ducked low and twisted out of his grasp. With a cry, she lurched away from the hedge and stumbled down the drive to the street and spun around and saw who it was. Pam recognized him immediately. You! she cried. I don't believe it! His eyes flashed with fear for just a moment, then anger drove out all other expression. As she gave to him in shock, he caught up with her, grabbed her by the shoulders, and tossed her hard to the asphalt driveway. 
He stood over her, then dropped down, pinning her to the drive. Too bad you turned around, he whispered. Chapter 23 Everything went white. Pam shut her eyes. When she reopened them, the light was still there. As she stared into it, it seemed to divide in two. It took her a few seconds to realize she was looking at car headlights moving slowly toward her. Where was her attacker? He was already running away. She spotted him darting along the hedges, keeping low until he reached the corner. Then he turned and disappeared in the heavy darkness. Pam got to her knees, and the earth seemed to tilt and spin. Still on the ground, she raised a hand and waved to the car. It stopped. The door on the driver's side opened. Here, please, she managed to cry. Stand up, she told herself, but the ground was too slanted. She wasn't sure she could get all the way up. She heard footsteps, heavy, hurried footsteps. Then two hands had her by the shoulders. Pam? She raised her head, trying to focus. Foxy! Confused and concerned, he held on to her. Pam? What's going on? Who was that? She shook her head. The ground was tilting back to normal. The hedges were and spinning quite so rapidly. Foxy, I'm so glad to see you, she managed to say. She allowed him to pull her to her feet. Then she leaned against him as he walked her to his car. Who was that? I saw someone running, he said, supporting her against his side. Foxy, she said. You won't believe who was blackmailing us. You just won't believe it. The next morning, Reva congratulated herself on arriving at the store on time. In fact, she was there ten minutes before the doors opened. I hope I'm not turning over a new leaf, she thought. Promptness is such a boring virtue. It was bound to be a busy day, she realized. The Friday before Christmas meant that last-minute shoppers would be thronging the store. On her way in, she had seen a line of people huddling against the morning cold, waiting for the doors to open. Reva decided a busy day would suit her just fine. Maybe having to wait on a lot of customers would help keep her mind occupied, so she could stop thinking about her conversation with Hank. She had thought of little else since the day before. At first, she had thought Hank was being cruel, but the more she considered what he said, the more she realized that he had spoken out of concern for her and she decided that he might have been right. She had always thought that there was something stupid and thick-headed about Hank, but that was only because it was necessary for her to feel superior to other people. Hank, she knew now, was a lot more sensitive than she had given him credit for. Could it really be Hank who was playing these disgusting, cruel jokes on her? Riva couldn't think about that now. She had been pacing around the first floor as she thought and had made her way to the electronics department when she heard shouting in the electronics storeroom. Riva stopped. She heard loud cursing and then grunts and groans. Shoes scraping against concrete, boxes falling, the sounds of people scuffling. She hurried to the doorway of the stockroom and peered in. Hey! she cried in alarm. What's going on? Stop it! The two boys wrestling in the middle of the floor ignored her and didn't even look up once from their fight. Mitch? What on earth? Reva cried. Mitch, red-faced, his thick black hair wild about his face, was wrestling with Rob, who was in full Santa costume except for the beard and red hat which were on the floor. Stop it! Come on, stop it! Reva pleaded. The two boys continued to ignore her, cursing each other angrily as they rolled on the floor, throwing wild punches. Reva stormed to the middle of the floor, leaned down, and tried to pull Rob off Mitch, but he wriggled out of her grasp and landed a hard punch on Mitch's jaw. What's going on here? All three of them turned around as Donald Rawson, the soccer manager, burst into the room. Rawson reacted quickly and strode over to the struggling boys. He quickly pulled Rob away. Mitch climbed slowly to his feet, rubbing his already swollen cheek. Rob's crazy, he told Rawson. He started it, for no reason. Rob glared silently at Mitch, gulping air, his face nearly as red as his costume. I don't want to hear about it, Rawson said angrily. Just get to work, he turned to Rob. Pick up your stuff and get your costume together. The doors are opening in less than five minutes. But, hey, Mitch started. Rawson raised a hand to cut him off. I said, I don't want to hear about it. Settle it after work, okay? Go out to the parking lot and beat each other senseless, but at least wait until Rob is out of costume, okay? That's all we need is for kids to see the Dolby Santa Claus in a fist fight with a stock clerk. The two boys looked as if they wanted to continue their fight, but Rawson stood between them, waiting with his arms crossed. Finally, Rob bent down and picked up his costume pieces before lumbering out of the storeroom. I don't believe you guys, Rawson muttered to Mitch. Then he too hurried out. Mitch avoided Reva's stare. He was still rubbing his swollen cheek. What was that all about? Reva asked, shaking her head, bewildered. Mitch shrugged. What do you care? He muttered. Then he headed over to the crates in the receiving area and started to unstack them. Reva watched him for a few seconds before heading to the main floor. Is everyone going crazy? She wondered. I couldn't find my list, but I still remember everything I want, Michael said excitedly. Holding his hand tightly, Reva led her little brother through an aisle mobbed with late afternoon shoppers. 
As they climbed a short flight of stairs, Santa Land came into view, a long line of kids against one wall, clinging to their parents, hopping up and down, chattering excitedly. Ooh, there he is, Michael exclaimed, his eyes lighting up. We have to wait in line, Reva said, pointing to where they had to go. Is that beard real? Michael asked, staring at Rob as he lifted a crying little girl off his lap. Why don't you ask him? Reva replied, laughing. No, I'm just going to ask for presents, Michael said seriously. They stepped to the end of the line. A tiny little girl, two at most, was seated on Rob's lap, tugging hard on his beard. Do I have to sit on his lap? Michael asked, and he seemed anxious all of a sudden about the experience he'd been looking forward to. Couldn't I just stand up next to him? Rob would probably appreciate that, Reva thought, but she told Michael, No, it's a law. You have to sit on his lap if you want to get the presents you ask him for. Michael thought about this earnestly, butting his lower lip. Reva laughed at how serious he appeared and ran her hand through his silky red hair. You don't want to hurt Tina's feelings, do you? He likes boys and girls to sit on his lap, she said. He likes it about as much as a toothache, she thought, chuckling. The line inched forward. Kids were climbing all over their parents, impatient to get their Santa visit over with. Several mothers fussed with cameras, ignoring the squawky kids at their feet. Finally, Michael was next in line. Do you think he knows my name? He asked Reva, still grasping her hand. I think you should tell him your name, Reva suggested. What about my address? Does Santa know my address? Before Reva could answer, one of Santa's elves, a young woman in a truly ridiculous costume with bells on her cap and on her soft pointy shoes, came over to usher Michael up to Santa's throne. He immediately let go of Reva's hand and... Half walking and half skipping followed the elf, an eager smile on his face. I should have brought a camera too, Reva thought, moving out of the line to the waiting area on the other side of Santa Land. Daddy should see this. She watched Michael as he made himself comfortable on Santa's lap, listing all the things he needed for Christmas, counting them off endlessly on his fingers. He had indeed memorized his entire list. When he was finally finished, he ran back to meet Reva, perplexed. That's him as a fake, he told her. Huh? She shook his hand. What are you talking about? It's not his real stomach. There's a pillow in there. I felt it. Well, he's just Santa's helper, Reva explained, guiding him toward the elevators. The real Santa is up at the North Pole, but Santa's helpers get all the information up to the real Santa in time. This seems to satisfy her brother. Feeling glad that she finally kept her promise to him, Reva dropped Michael off on the sixth floor at her father's office. Then, humming to herself, she returned to the perfume counter. There behind the counter, she found another enormous carton waiting for her. Like the one before it, it, too, was tied in a broad red ribbon with a bow on the top. Reva sighed. When did this come in? She asked Mrs. Smith. Please, I'm with a customer, her supervisor snapped. Some of us here actually wait on customers. Another stupid mean trick, Reva thought, staring at the big carton. Only this time, I'm not going to scream and carry on. I'd have to be pretty stupid to fall for the same thing twice in a row. She sniffed the ribbon with a pair of scissors, then cut off the tape that secured the lid. Someone has a really juvenile sense of humor, she told herself. Sick and juvenile. I suppose another poor mannequin has been sacrificed in an attempt to scare me to death. She pulled back the lid and stared inside, and froze. Her breath caught in her throat. She started to choke. She spun her head away, but the sight didn't leave. It seemed to be burned into her eyes. This was no mannequin, no mannequin. It was Mitch, crumpled up in the bottom of the carton and the blood that had dripped down his back and made a small puddle on the carton floor was real, because there was a large kitchen knife shoved between Mitch's shoulder blades. Chapter 24 Every time Reva closed her eyes, she saw Mitch, saw his knees pressed against the side of the carton, rising up over his bowed head, saw his shoulders sloped forward in the carton, arms hanging limply at his sides, saw the back of his neck, so pale, his shiny black hair, usually so carefully brushed, matted against his head, saw the dark stain on the back of his shirt, the puddle of coagulated blood on the carton bottom soaking through his jeans, saw the knife handle, the tiny gleam of blade protruding from it, placed so perfectly, so symmetrically in the middle of his shoulder blades. Every time Reva closed her eyes, she saw all of this, and when her eyes were open, she couldn't see clearly, couldn't think clearly, couldn't think of anything else. When the police questioned her, Two soft-spoken police officers, one not much older than Reva, she couldn't think, could barely speak. Why would anyone murder Mitch? Why would someone murder Mitch and gift-wrap him for her? Reva had no answers. And there was Lisa, leaning her head on the glass of the perfume counter, sobbing and smearing the glass with her tears. She couldn't help the police either. After the questions, after what seems like hours of police milling and poking around, after the photographers, after the reporters, the paramedics, 
the hushed crowds of muttering onlookers after the lifeless body had been covered and carried away, and the carton had been dragged away, leaving a wide scum of blood in its wake. Revis still saw the body, still the poor, slumped over Mitch. She remembered kissing him in the stockroom. She remembered Lisa breaking in on them. She remembered laughing at Mitch after Lisa broke up with him. And she saw Lisa, her face red and puffy from crying so long, cast an accusing glance at Reva. Accusing. Deserved. I owe Mitch an apology, Reva thought, but it's too late. Too late to tell him I'm sorry. And for the first time in years, Reva felt like crying. Felt like it, but still managed to hold the tears in. Go home, her father said gently, his warm hands on her trembling shoulders. Shall I have someone drive you home? No, it's okay, I'll be okay, she said, reaching up to squeeze his hand. I'll never be okay, she thought. At home that evening, she kept seeing Mitch, kept apologizing to him in her mind. That night, she forced him away, forced herself to fall into a deep sleep, a sleep of troubling dreams, complicated and violent. Just before two in the morning, Reva sat straight up, wide awake. I know who killed Mitch, she said aloud. Chapter 25 Clay, did you kill Mitch? Sprawled on Mickey's couch, Clay looked up at Pam, the smile fading from his face. Did you? Pam demanded, standing over him, her hands on her hips. Did you kill him? The wind rattled the loose pane in the living room window. Mickey stepped out of the shadows of the darkened kitchen and turned on the floor lamps next to the couch. His face was drawn, Pam saw, his eyes tense, wary. He held a half-eaten three musketeers in his left hand, but wasn't chewing on it. Clay didn't reply. Give me a break, Pam, he muttered, rolling his eyes. I'm not going to let you off the hook, Pam said. I want to know, Clay. I have to know. After I told you that Mitch was the one who was blackmailing us, that Mitch was the one who grabbed me and threatened me, did you go to the store and kill him? Of course he didn't, Mickey interrupted, speaking with unusual fervor, but he sounded more hopeful than convinced. Tell her, Clay, he urged. Stop being so stubborn. Clay snickered. She's accusing me of murder, and you accuse me of being stubborn, he said wryly. I don't believe this. Well, Mitch is dead, Pam said heatedly, crossing her arms over her chest, refusing to retreat from her position, glaring down at Clay. And he was murdered. So, Clay asked, his gray eyes flashing angrily. You think I did it? Yeah, Mickey agreed. What makes you think it was Clay who did it? Because he said he'd do it, she told Mickey impatiently. Clay said when he found out who was threatening us, he'd kill him. She turned back to Clay, who now had a smile on his face. What if I did kill him? he asked. Did you? Pam insisted. He shrugged, his smile insolent, defiant. Pam glanced over at Mickey, who was still standing at the lamp. In the yellow light, he looked frightened. Clay? He let the candy bar drop from his hand. It landed noiselessly on the worn carpet. Staring hard at Clay, he didn't bother to pick it up. Clay ignored him, continuing to smirk at Pam. You didn't kill him, did you? Mickey asked, his voice frightened and small. Come on, man, just say you didn't, okay? Okay, I didn't, Clay said, still smirking. I don't believe you, Pam said. She glanced over at Mickey. It was obvious that Mickey had changed his mind about Clay. He didn't believe Clay either. Hey, come on, guys, Clay said, pushing himself up on his feet from the low couch. He took a step forward, rolling down the sleeve of his black Motley Crew t-shirt, forcing Pam to back away. Get out of my face, okay? I'm telling you the truth. I didn't croak Mitch, all right? He walked to the window and stared out into the tiny front yard. I wanted to, he said this back to them. When I found out, he was in the store that night watching us the whole time. I wanted to kill him, but then I thought about it, you know? And I decided he wasn't worth it. He was just a worm. Why should I mess up my life on account of a worm? Mickey picked up his candy bar and tossed it onto the low table by the wall. He and Pam exchanged glances. They were each trying to decide whether to believe Clay or not. I hope you're telling the truth, man, Mickey said, walking up close to Clay. Because if you're lying, we... Without warning, Clay spun around and grabbed the front of Mickey's gray sweatshirt. He jerked it violently, nearly pulling Mickey off his feet. I'm not a liar, he screamed, his features hard and menacing. At that moment, Mr. Wiggly stepped into the room from the dark kitchen. Hey! He seemed surprised by the violent confrontation across the room. Clay immediately let go of Mickey's sweatshirt, and Mickey stumbled backward quickly, regaining his balance. Mr. Wakeley stood blinking in the light. He was stooped and unsteady on his legs. It was obvious he'd been drinking. He's aged ten years in just the past week, Pam thought. Get out of here if you're going to fight, he screamed, shaking his fist at Mickey. Get out! Get out! He lunged toward Mickey and nearly fell over his own feet. He's totally out of control, Pam thought. 
There's no reason for him to be so angry at Mickey. We were just going out, Dad, Mickey said, backing off. Come on, guys. They grabbed their coats, and a few seconds later were standing out front, shivering in the swirling winter wind. Sorry about Dad, Mickey apologized, obviously embarrassed. I don't know what his problem is. He kicked at a rock at the curb, shooting it across the street. I'm out of here, Clay said glumly, unless you want to call the cops on me and turn me in for killing Mitch. He glared at Pam and Mickey, challenging them. You didn't do it, Mickey said softly. I know you didn't do it, man. That odd smile returned to Clay's face. The smile Pam couldn't interpret, the one that sent a cold chill down her spine.